Well, warm greetings to you this morning, and all of you joining us online, warm greetings to you as well. By the way, online, uh, we're about to take communion in a little while, so if you're joining us online, you can get your elements ready now, and we'll have communion together in just a little bit. Would you please join me in the Gospel of Luke? Find the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, or you can use the YouVersion Bible app, click on More Events, find our church, click on our church, and all the verses we're going to look at today will be right there in the palm of your hand. And as you're doing that, let me ask you a question. How many of you have visited our nation's capital, Washington, D.C.? Where are you at? All right. I, I visited a few times, and personally, I find it to be a rather inspiring place when you learn the history of it. The older I get, the more I like history. And who's with me? All right. Yeah. So, uh, of course, in particular at our nation's capital are all the memorials that you'll find there. Here's, you know, the Jefferson... Uh, Lincoln, Washington, and there's the, the, new, the newest one, the World War II Memorial. It's just loaded with memorials that really tell a story. Matter of fact, have you ever really thought about why do we have memorials? Have you ever really thought about that? What purpose do memorials serve? Well, I thought about that a little bit, and really what memorials do is they kind of tie us into all three tenses of life, past, present, and future. Obviously, they tie us into the past of a a significant person or event in history. They tie us into the present because here we are living today in light of that significant event or person in history. But then they also tie us into the future because by their design, by their permanency, uh, they're equipped to help us tell our children and our children's children about that significant event or person. So really, they tie us into all three tenses of life. And if you were just to summarize what a memorial is supposed to do, you're supposed to stand in front of it and simply say, we remember. We remember. Well, for all of us who are followers of Jesus, all these memorials, I think, are significant, and we, we should honor them. But there is one memorial for us that stands above them all. And you're going to find it right here in the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. Let me show you, please. When the hour came, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is being given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Okay, so here at Trinity, we just kind of like to march down a passage of Scripture. Let's go back then and find verse 15 and chew on this one. So Jesus says to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Okay, here's the context then of what's happening. Jesus is literally enjoying his last supper. This is his final meal, and it's a special one. It's called the Passover meal. Maybe you've heard of it if you remember your Old Testament, that there was a season about 1,400 years before Christ came. There was a season where the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. They were enslaved for generations, but then by the power of God's right hand, he sets them free. And here's how the Bible accounts for it in the, in the book of Exodus chapter 12. It says, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, but when he sees the blood on the lintel, this is the blood of the lamb that they were instructed to slay. They take the blood of the lamb and they put it on the lintel, that's the horizontal support, and on the two doorposts of their home. When they do that, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer, the angel of death, to come into your house to strike you. And you shall keep this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. And when you enter the land which the Lord will give you as he has promised, you shall keep this rite, this ritual, this memorial. And when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you, then you shall say it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord because he passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our homes. Okay, so God institutes a memorial for the Israelites. And you could see just through this passage that that memorial ties them into all three tenses. This Passover meal, if you will, ties them into the past when they celebrate how the angel of death passed over them 
And this was the final act of God by which he set his people free from slavery in Egypt to go into the promised land. So it also then ties them into the present because now they're set free, now they're delivered, now they're living in freedom to worship God in a new land. But then it also obviously ties them to the future because as this passage says, they're to keep this ordinance for you and your children forever. It's a memorial meal. Now, if you know, if you know Jewish people, they love tradition, right? Remember Fiddler on the Roof? Tradition, right? And so they, they codified sort of how to do the Passover meal, all right? And they put it into a book. It's called the Haggadah, easy to remember. Like when it comes to Passover, you got a Haggadah, all right? <laughs> Haggadah, okay. So you come to the uh, Haggadah, and you're talking about Passover, and it tells you how to, how to do the Passover meal. How many of you have done a Passover meal? Okay, a handful of it. I encourage you to do it sometime. It's inspirational. But don't be in a hurry. And go through the line at Whataburger afterwards. You, all right? <laughs> just, just trust me on that. Okay. So you come to the Passover meal, and you take this bread. It's called the matzah bread. And there are three pieces of it. And you take the middle piece, and you break it. And when you do that, the leader says this. Look, this is the bread of suffering, the humble and simple bread which our ancestors ate in Egypt on the first Passover. Let all who are hungry come and join us at this Seder and let them eat of what we have to share. This is what the leader of the Passover meal would say when it came time to break the bread. And Jesus is leading this Passover meal. And I'm sure he said that, but then, can we go back and look? Did you notice he instituted something new? When he said this in verse 19, when he had taken some of the bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is new. This is my body, which is being given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So out of this memorial meal for the Israelites is born our memorial meal as followers of Christ. He takes the bread, which for long had symbolized the bread of suffering, and he says, this bread of suffering no longer represents the bread which our forefathers ate in, the, in, the, in Egypt when they were delivered. Now this bread represents me, Jesus says. It's my body. My body is the body of suffering. And I'm giving it for you. This is a memorial meal to point us back to the death of Christ. And here's how 1 Corinthians 5, 7 puts it. Get rid of the old yeast, referring to the bread, so that you may be new unleavened batch, because leaven is a symbol of sin, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So this memorial meal then reminds us that Jesus willingly sacrificed himself. He took on our suffering. That's what the bread reminds us of. It's our, now memor it's our memorial service. All right, And if you've ever experienced a, a Seder meal, you know that there are four different times during the course of the Seder meal where you drink wine. Pour small glasses, all right? Or else you're going to have a really good time at the Passover meal. Okay. And when the leader of um, the Seder meal takes the third cup, you, you have the meal, and then after the meal, you drink the third cup. It's called the cup of redemption, okay? This cup of redemption was to remind the people of how God redeemed them. To redeem means to purchase uh, back something at a cost. To purchase something back at a cost, and that cost is called a ransom, a ransom payment. So let's say you're a slave. A hero can come along, purchase your freedom from enslavement, and the, the payment price for your freedom is called a ransom. And so that's what God did for our forefathers in the faith, they were enslaved. He came along and paid the price, if you will, to redeem them, to buy them back to himself and paid the price for their freedom. And so in celebration of that, the leader of the Seder meal would take that third cup, the cup of redemption, and say this, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech ha'olam b'rei peri hagafen, which means blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine and then they would drink. So Jesus gets to the third cup, the cup of redemption, and he holds it. And in the same way, in verse 20, he took the cup after they had eaten, but instead, maybe after he says that, he says this, 
This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. That's brand new. That had to shock his apostles who were with him at the table because they knew what was coming. They had been doing it for 1,400 years this way. So this was a total shocker. This is a game changer. Now, what does this mean? Well, the book of Hebrews helps us understand this in chapter 9. It says that the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God? How much more will he cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died, here it is, as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Beloved, this is the good news. This is what this table is all about. This is what our memorial meal, our most paramount memorial is all about, that Jesus Christ, as a gift of God, poured out his blood for us. He died for us. He suffered for us so that we could participate in what the Bible calls the new covenant because God had established what we call the old covenant with the nation of Israel. But he also, in that covenant, promised us that he would offer a new covenant. This is in Jeremiah 31, that one day he would offer a new covenant, not just for the Jew, but also for the Gentile, that everyone could participate. And in this new covenant relationship with God, kind of like you have a covenant of marriage, you get to enter into a covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and I got great news for you. When you enter into this covenant relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, it changes all three tenses of your life. This passage said, going to your past, that you are cleansed from all the acts that led to death, that sin. When you come to Christ and through his death, you are cleansed of all your sin. That's good news. It also says that you get to participate in the eternal inheritance that's waiting for you. That's heaven. That's your future. And it also impacts your present because now, as this passage says, here's your present. The reason why Jesus cleansed you of all your sin is so that you may, verse 14, serve the living God. If you're looking for a purpose in life, here it is. The reason why Jesus cleansed you is so that Every day you can get up out of bed and serve the living God. He gives you purpose because of his ransom. Isn't that amazing? It's almost like God's got a plan. <laughs> it's almost like history is unfolding his master plan. And when you and I choose to participate in it, we become part of his masterpiece. That's what this table reminds us of. Now, here's what Eric noticed that captured him. So as Jesus is holding these emblems of his suffering, would you go back and look with me? Watch what he does. Back in verse 17, he takes the cup and gave thanks. And in verse 19, he takes the bread, the bread of his suffering, and he gives thanks. And after seeing this, Eric came into my office and said, Hey, Sherm, have you ever really stopped to think about the times when Jesus gave thanks? And i got to be honest with you, I never really had. Well, this gripped him. This is why we're doing this series. Because at the most unusual, uncommon times, Jesus gave thanks as he's holding the emblems of his death and suffering, he gave thanks. He gave thanks for the opportunity to sacrifice himself for a greater cause. Beloved, that is uncommon gratitude. And I was thinking about our culture. Can we just be honest? It seems, it seems to me, anyway, increasingly so, that you and I are living in a culture that looks for and almost expects to be served instead of to serve. Would you agree with me on that? That's like help wanted posters everywhere for people to come and serve. We're having a hard time finding people to serve. 
but we all kind of expect to be served. So how unique would it be for a group of people to get up every day to serve the living God and to look for and be grateful for opportunities to serve? To even sacrifice a little bit for a cause greater than yourself. That would surely set us apart from the rest of the world. Well, Pastor, where do I begin? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to suggest that we begin at home. Here's what the Bible says. Husbands and wives, let's begin with wives. Verse 22 of Ephesians 5. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. And then husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. That sacrifice. Sacrificial love is the hallmark of a fantastic marriage. Wives, I'm sure in order for you to submit to your husband as to the Lord, you have to sacrifice your pride. You have to sacrifice your will because we know that you are right. It just takes us a little longer to get there, right? <laughs> and husbands, this is only the most difficult passage in the entire Bible to obey. Our standard for loving our wives is the cross. People, I guess because I'm older now, whenever I officiate a wedding, people ask me, how many, how many weddings have you done, Pastor Sherm? The truth is I've lost count. I'm going to guess around 300. And there's probably a 90% chance in a ceremony a wedding ceremony, that I will look the groom square in the eye and say, hey, bro, until you find yourself on a cross for her, your job's not done. Sacrifice. Being grateful for opportunities to serve your spouse. Let's begin at home. That's uncommon gratitude. Second, with our friends. Remember what Jesus said, John 15? Greater love has no one than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. That's sacrificial love, the hallmark of a great friendship. May I ask you a personal question? Do you have a friend that you love that much? I did a little research on friendship in America today, and, it, and according to many reports and statistics, friendship is just on the decline in our country, especially post-COVID. In every demographic, people are talking to their friends less, relying on their friends less, spending time with their friends less. Social isolation is on the increase, and so is loneliness. But the Bible says, greater love is known than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. My encouragement is to have a friend like that, and my mom would say the best way to have a friend like that is to be one. Look for opportunities to serve your friends. That's uncommon gratitude. Third, in our community, Paul said this to the church in Galatia, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Let us look for opportunities to serve and bless all people, people who don't look like us, people who don't act like us, people who don't believe like us, people who don't vote like us, all people. How uncommon would that be if we get up every day with an attitude and a, of a purpose to serve the living God and look for opportunities to serve those who might not even like us or agree with us. That would just be so like Jesus. But the passage doesn't end there. It says, let us do good, not just to all people, but especially to those who belong to the family of believers. That's us. So biblically speaking, it's, it's actually okay for us to sort of prioritize caring for one another, serving one another in the church. Matter of fact, I'll just say, as we go into the holiday time, we have a fund uh, in our church that we set aside month, uh, every month we set aside money into this fund. We call it the Benevolence Fund. 
and it's here for you. For if you're going through a really hard time, uh, and you're really struggling, and you could use a hand up, not a hand out. It's designed to be sort of a one-time, get you through a hard time thing, and you could use some. It's just sitting there for you. It's how, one of the ways we take care of each other in here. And so if you could use some of that, just please contact me as discreetly and privately as possible. I promise you, we will take care of you as best we can. That's church. That's okay. Let's look for opportunities to bless and serve one another in the church as well. well. Let me wrap up with this. Back in D.C., out of all the memorials that I got to experience, probably the most moving one for me was the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. How many of you have been to that, seen that? Okay, several of us. These soldiers, whew, they have to meticulously meet requirements. It is like an extremely tremendous honor to be one of these soldiers, to guard the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And these guys will guard the tomb 24 hours a day, seven days a week, come hell or high water, come hurricanes, storms, summer, fall, winter, spring, doesn't matter. They do their 21 paces. It's, it's really almost mechanical, these guys, what they do. They take their jobs extremely seriously. And that got me thinking about us and our memorial. If we could just capture the vigilance, the seriousness, and the gratitude of these soldiers. But here's the difference, beloved. We know the name of our hero, and his tomb is empty. So I pray that you and I, in gratitude, would wake up every day to serve the living God with uncommon gratitude. Amen? Amen. That's what a good soldier of Jesus Christ does.